Hey guys, so we're both super excited to be able to share this with you. A couple weeks ago, we got to talk to one of my favorite authors in the whole wide world, Jonathan L. Howard. It was so nice of him to speak with us. We ended up having a very long conversation about, obviously, Cabal, but then other works that he's doing, um, the way the Cabal series is going to continue. His upcoming book in October, as, Murder and Lovecraft. As well as some possible TV Yeah! Stuff. It was, as I said, great to talk to him. And here is our interview with Jonathan L. Howard. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, my pleasure. I have to say, Alexander just loves your books. <laughs> I think it's your favorite book of all time. Yes. <laughs> I'm a little speechless right now, so <laughs> it's really funny to watch. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess I'll start then. Thanks for leaving me in the best. Sorry. <laughs> Um, one of our first questions I guess we had was just kind of uh, wondering what it was like to work kind of in a different genre for each of your Cabal books. Like, was it challenging switching styles, or what did you enjoy most about each style? Um, well, that's the thing. It's it's less um, genre changes, or certainly it's less a stylistic change, and more down to genre. Um, the first of the Cabal novels, Johannes Cabal the Necromancer, it's uh, a very picaresque story, at least for about two thirds of its length. Uh, so it's all got these little uh, vignettes in it before it goes into the uh, the third act, which is a, a single long section in a single location. Um, and that, I think, just came from I'm fond of short stories and I'm fond of picaresque stories. So that was kind of that one. Um, detective is, shockingly enough, a detective story. <laughs> um, although it's also got the kind of Ruritanian intrigues, uh, you know, the Prisoner of Zender, that kind of thing. In fact, Ruritania gets a name check at one point. Then on to the... Uh, the Fear Institute, which is a, a, a flat-out quest story of um, much be beloved of high fantasy. And then The Brothers Cabal, I suppose most of it is a kind of man-on-the-spot story. You know, things like um, 39 Steps or Rogue Mail, where it's one person in an awkward situation. And um, for a good chunk of it, everybody's out after him. Uh, and then alliances start to form, and uh, it, it it, sort of a cruise like coral onto the story after that and um number five um i'm not going to talk about it too much at the moment it's still being written but uh there you go um yes it's i think a lot of it is simply because i'd get bored writing the same story several times in a row um so I take a ball and I, I throw him into different sand pits and, and see how much he flounders about before he manages to get out of them. <laughs> Which one did you enjoy kind of stylistically the most? That's that's quite tricky, actually. Um, I think possibly Brothers Cabal, simply because I get to have all these secret societies and quite a lot of characters in it. In fact, out of the Cabal books, it's probably the one that needed the largest rewrite because it originally had significantly more important characters in it. And I was thinking, I don't need all these people and it's making it too complicated. So cutting them out was um, turned out to be quite involved. And the um, in, in fact... One of the characters who'd been cut managed to live, stay in it all the way to the final copy edit, lurking in a single sentence towards the end of the book. And the copy editor went, who's this? And both myself and my, um, my line editor went, ah, <laughs> cut out this last, <laughs> this last reference. <laughs> they, they've been clinging on by their fingernails right to the end. But, uh, but I don't know, maybe they'll turn up in a later book. So this kind of segues into the next question. Was it difficult switching between perspectives of Johannes and Horst? Because they're on two different ends of the spectrum, Cabal, well, Johannes being very static and like stiff, kind of rigid, I don't know. 
that's not quite what I mean, but <laughs> and then <laughs> forced is very just like fun. Yeah. <laughs> Not too badly, actually. They, as characters, they're pretty well rounded in my mind. I I find swapping between them uh, quite easy because I know how either of them would think in a particular circumstance. So no, I, I find swapping between them uh, quite easily, uh, easy rather. And well, you've read the Brothers Cabal. A lot of it is told from um, Horst's point of view. So um, I I got more time to be in his shoes than his previous appearances. Do <laughs> uh, uh, you find that people like prefer one over the other, or is it kind of like divided down the middle? Um, people tend to like them both. Uh, I've never heard of anybody saying, oh, I, I love Johannes and I can't stand Horst, or vice versa. Um, they, they, they like them as a, as a package deal. So... The, Yes. Sorry, they work so well as a package. Yeah, it's um, yeah, they're kind of different, different. I mean, as brothers, they have familial uh, similarities anyway in, in outlook and all the rest of it. Um, that, that's unavoidable from, just because they they were raised in the same household, but they, in terms of personality, they went in very different directions. But they are kind of reflections in a way. What Horst is good at. Johanna's isn't, and vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> we always, I don't know, when we're talking about these books, we always seem to characterize <laughs> them in voice, and Horace is always, like, shouting and very excited about everything, <laughs> and Johanna's is just very, like, I mean, pen. Yeah. Um, in my mind's ear, Horst is, uh, is generally a kind of... Uh, he's just enthusiastic about things, not necessarily shouting, but he's upbeat. <laughs> He likes to see the best in people. <laughs> and even when he's surrounded by people who want him dead, he's still trying to look for, you know, nice things about them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. He does take the time to admire them. <laughs> if you hear slurping here now and then, it's because I've got a cup of tea here. So just to explain that. No, he actually can't hear anything. <laughs> All right, good. You gave away your secret. <laughs> Um, how important are names to your characters? Uh, um, generally very important. I mean, uh, Johannes Cabal himself came from... Uh, the character went through several stages, and for the early stages, he was English. Uh, but that got dropped fairly quickly. I think possibly just I wanted him to be very efficient and quite emotionless and the national stereotype for that is German and so not even consciously he kind of just drifted over to being German I don't think I actually sat down and thought I will make him German because uh, it just happened um, but with his name uh, Johannes is essentially John and Cabal is a slightly mysterious thing where it's got occult connotations to it obviously Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted the idea of um, a simple common name and then an interesting short second name uh, because it chimes in with, uh, well, characters like, um, oh God, who came up with him? Um, John Silence. Oh, look, that's going to bother me. I'm terrible with names. Who came up with John Silence? He's an occult investigator anyway. Um, and he's got this great name. It's John, and then you've got Silence, which is this wonderfully enigmatic, short second name, and Cabal worked along the same lines. Um, as a rule, the names of characters will either be, um, well, some of them are puns, mm -hmm. and some of them are in-jokes, and some of them are references, and are, some of them are purely there just because they sound good. <laughs> But uh, yeah, names names are always important. I, I like to think I never sort of just throw a name in there because I'll, I'll bung some syllables together and it'll be fine. Um, I, I like to have them kind of trip out in one way or another off the tongue nicely or for them to be a, a lurking little Easter egg if you can ever figure out why this particular person is called that. <laughs> so do names come before the characters or do characters come before the names? Uh, characters come before names. Uh, they have to really, because 
if the name is going to the name fits the character. I, I can't go around fitting characters to names; that would just be weird. So yes, the name it's always a character first, and then I come up with a name that uh, suits them. Or as I say, I find something something punish or an in joke or um or I just look around references and uh, find somebody who kind of fits the bill and perhaps muck around with their name a little bit. So uh, it's one of our other big fascinations, especially like just reading fantasy fiction kind of is how worlds kind of come to be. And so we were wondering, um, what process did you kind of use for building the Kabbalah universe and how does it kind of reflect the characters? It's interesting. I never sat down and worked out in any huge detail what Kabbalah's world looks like in the first instance. The uh, the original idea with Johannes Cabal the Necromancer was I wanted a kind of slightly dreamlike feel to it, which is why I went out of my time out of my way never to mention a year and then to mix in different elements that meant that you could never really date it. It's got stuff from the eighteen seventies or the eighteen eighties all the way through to the nineteen fifties. Um, and it could sort of be from anywhere in this great amorphous period. So it's it's cabal time, really. And the the version of England that they're going around in uh, Necromancer again is this is a kind of fantasy never never England. All the the names of all the towns are made up, and again they're full of uh, puns and just names that sounded good and a few references and this kind of thing um and that's how necromancer was put together and with every extra new thing about cabal i've written it's nailed the world down a little bit more but sort of focused it a little bit more that was unavoidable uh, as in Johannes cabal the detective i came up with the um this sort of fantasy version of eastern europe um which you can kind of more or less slot in where the Balkans are, maybe kind of extended balkans a bit. So that's where Macavia and Senza and um, uh, Ketamania and uh, Polo Rus and all these places are. Um, but there are real-world countries there as well. He, he goes to uh, Greece in one of the short stories. Italy gets a few mentions. Um, he's been to America. So... It's um, a sort of our world, but with some other bits kind of wedged in. Were there any uh, kind of elements that kind of just popped up and surprised you when you're kind of writing through them? Um, oh, that always happens. I mean, you never really know what's going to come up. It's one of the reasons why I don't like writing very, very detailed uh, plot outlines beforehand because as often as not, you end up throwing away a great chunk of it when, during the writing, you simply have a better idea. You go, well, just a if I went this way instead of that way, uh, this all resolves much more nicely. Uh, referring to the Fear Institute, I was a good third of the way into the novel when I had a better idea for the ending, and I threw out the original ending in its entirety and completely replaced it. Um, thankfully, before I got there, but it ha- but it happens. You um, yes, you're you're constantly in in a state of being a little bit surprised by what comes along, simply because new situations and new characters they they suggest new things. The number of times minor characters have spiraled off to become quite important um, happens with monotonous regularity. How, what was the process like for creating like the ant monsters and? Like they seem so complicated. I mean, you've got like these drawings of like the ship in like detective and everything. But how much of that was like post production? I guess. Well, um, the idea, I had the idea for the Entomopters uh, a long time ago. Um, uh, back in my when I was employed as a game designer, and I was playing around with ideas for things that are a little bit different, and. You, you're familiar with the old thing about, uh, according to the laws of aerodynamics, a bumblebee can't fly. Yeah. 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 Yes, it plainly does. It's because it, you'd be applying the wrong laws of aerodynamics to it. If you're uh, applying the, 
the laws as they apply to a fixed wing aircraft. No, it can't fly. But if you apply the laws as apply to a, a rotary wing aircraft like a helicopter, yes, it works. So I got to thinking, well, if essentially it's aerodynamics of a dragonfly or similar to that of a helicopter, if instead of having uh, a, a rotary blade, you had this hideously complex system with all these side blades, then um, then maybe that would work. It would be practical. I really doubt it would be practical, but it might be possible. And that's good enough, really. <laughs> so <laughs> I have got these um, these entomopters flying around using the same principles of flight as um, a dragonfly or a bumblebee. And as for the um, the aero ships, the, the heavier than air ships, uh, that harkens back to just some of the kind of not so much even Victorian ideas. The the etheric line guides that they use to gain energy and to drag themselves through the sky that does harken back to Victorian ideas of science and the ether and all the rest of it. But the thing about gyroscopic levitation, um, that comes from a couple of places, I suppose. The main one is back in, I think, the 1980s. It was this, um, an RAF engineer retired uh, called Sandy Kidd, who thought he'd found a way to develop levitational lift on gyroscopes. And the practicality of it is that... Um, no, it turns out that theoretically there's all manner of reasons why it doesn't work. But it's a lovely idea. The idea of gyroscopes being able to um, to fight against gravity. And so that's why they've got gyroscopic levitators in them. And that's how it, um, it makes itself lighter than air and then gets dragged along on the etheric line guide. So it's kind of hodgepodge of, um, of wishful thinking and pseudoscience. It was... Only in hindsight, in fact, I just stumbled across it completely by accident after the book was out. When I was a kid, I saw a Thunderbird. Do you know Thunderbirds? Yeah. Yeah, there's a Thunderbirds film called Thunderbird 6. And in that, Brains builds a heavier-than-air airship, which is called Airship 1 or something. I forget what he calls it. And it's never really explained how it flies, but you do see its engineering section and it's full of these rotating loops, which the fanciful of mine could be taken to be gyroscopic. So I don't know, maybe Jerry Anderson was thinking along the same lines as well, but there you go. On the topic of detectives, so Leone Barrow takes on a pretty hefty role, but we uh -huh. don't really see her after the events of detectives. Is she coming back or is she gone forever? Uh, I'm very, very sorry to say that um, she's coming back. Yes, she will be back. I'm a stinker, aren't I? Yes, she will be coming back. Um, I've got a short story planned out that I want her to be in. And as far as I'm concerned, it's part of continuity, even though it's not written yet. But the, she will be turning up in a short story when I get around to writing it. And uh, I, I didn't want to talk too much about number five, but what the hell, yes, she's going to be in number five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was kind of like going back through the different books and I was like trying to figure out how many female characters actually were there I was actually surprised there weren't too many of them no there's um, there's relatively few uh, which which I, I I regret in terms of um, in what I personally like in books but given the milieu almost unavoidable it being the kind of Victorian Edwardian yeah for stuff, sure um yeah, so when they do turn up, I try to make uh, make female characters important. There are certainly, there's loads of them in um, Fear Institute. Uh, oh, not, yeah. not not Fear Institute, sorry. Um, uh, 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 I can forget the names of my own own books here. Brothers Cabal. There's there's scad loads of them in Brothers yeah. Cabal. Women all over the place. The monstrous regiment of them. So uh, yeah, there's loads of them there. I think, yeah, I think you're right, though. I think it was like a style change because I didn't even notice until I was kind of sitting back after number four and I was like, oh, oh, yeah, there are tons of women in this one, but they they, they weren't in the other one. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing was with the Fear Institute, um, 
you've only got a handful of central characters anyway. Yeah. And one of them is obviously going to be Cabal, and the other one is, and the other protagonists are the members of the Institute, and the nature of the Institute is very masculine anyway. Yeah. So I, it, I did consider making one of them a woman, and it, it just didn't really work with the way that the the Institute functions and its mindset. It, 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 it did seem like tokenism. That said, uh, still got uh, Miss Smith, the Necropolis witch. Yeah. Who I like as a character. She's good. Um, but yes, you're quite right. There aren't many female characters in um, the Fear Institute. Uh, I hope I made up for that in the Brothers Cabal. <laughs> I think so. But I mean, the female characters that you do have in there are very strong in their own right. So it's better to have good rather than... Yeah, as I say, if 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 I crowd barred any more into um, the Fear Institute, it they would have stuck a lot of sore thumbs. It would have been tokenism. Um, it's not helped by the Dreamlands are basically H.P. Lovecraft's sandbox, and he's terrible on female characters. I think it's about two in all his uh, books. There's certainly not many, so it's a very sort of um, masculine environment anyway so it, it is what it is but um yes yes it, that that's a blip i like to think <laughs> <laughs> so we were wondering about your writing process is it like does it how does it change between short stories and writing novels um as a rule not greatly um obviously a novel requires substantially more planning than a short story and i have had problems with uh novels in the past where they they've just run into a cul-de-sac and refused to come out again um but that's simply because there's so many um balls to keep in the air at any particular time and it's not as if i haven't had similar problems with uh short stories on occasion uh, a year or so ago i had a story called um um, a Scandal with Bohemians, which was published in the collection Schemers from Stoneskin Press. And that one, oh dear, uh, I had my central characters and I was trying to weave this story around them. And as the name of the anthology suggests, it's all about schemes and plans and conspiracies and all the rest of it. And you need a, you need a conspiracy that holds together. And I came up with one, and it just, the wheels kept falling off. It didn't make sense. It had huge holes in it. It was just awful. And I kept trying to fix it and kept trying to fix it. And my editor got back to me and said, how's this story coming along? And I went, ah, not so great, actually. Um, and then I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to fix something that's essentially unfixable. So I binned it. I hung on to the central protagonists and the general kind of uh, environment for them and came up with a completely different plot and it just flowed. It was great after having so much trouble with the uh, the first version. Uh, just having gritting my teeth and dumping the work I'd already done it it fixed itself. So, uh, so I've probably had more trouble with a short story than I have had on a novel. Uh, admittedly, the one I'm writing at the moment, uh, L5, it's got a complex form. It's structurally, it's it's difficult, and I won't say this has been an e easy piece of writing, but it's getting there. <laughs> so um, yes, I, generally, I, I I find short stories easier simply in terms of they're less complicated and require less planning and I can I can jump in and get them done more quickly but I love short stories I always have I love to read them I enjoy writing them um it's just a real shame that the the short story market is nowhere near as strong as, as historically it has been there's a good chance that it could be coming back with the e-reader thing because a lot of people have e-readers and short stories for like 99 cents it, well exactly I've, I've got um a bunch of short stories and things uh, online myself that I publish through things like um, um, uh, Smashwords and Amazon Kindle and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. and and that's good. It's it allows me to sort of vent ideas that are t 
too small for novels and given the size of the uh, the small the short story publishing market um it they can frequently be difficult sells as well so i it, just putting them out as a as you say a little 99 cent thing and if people buy it great and if they don't well at least the thing got written what would you say was the hardest scene or sequence that you've ever had to write well, um, ever had to write, that's not actually in the Cabal books. That's, um, are you familiar with, um, my YA series, uh, the Rosalka Chronicles? I am. I haven't read them. They're actually sitting on my e-reader right now, but. <laughs> okay. Well, in the second one, um, Catcher's War, there was a particular scene that I found emotionally difficult to write um quite upsetting and i had to go for a walk after i'd written it um so it had to be written and it was no fun at all <laughs> no fun at all uh, it was yeah, as i say it was quite upsetting and that's in the ya books the horror ones the ones for the adult market oh just breeze through those there's no trouble with them. <laughs> <laughs> um i also i also don't like killing uh characters willy nilly um i try to have an emotional investment in in the death of characters especially protagonists or even main antagonists um there's there's um oh avoiding spoilers you'll know what i'm talking about if i <laughs> say the the um there's a bloke wearing plus fours in um, Johannes Cabal the Necromancer, who, um, when he goes down, I, I again I found it quite difficult to write because it's writing about death and death should never be easy. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, there's there's always a bit of a uh about it, e even in the kind of flip off hand deaths that turn up here and there. But yes, oddly enough. The hardest to write scene was in Catcher's War. Um, I, I found that um, I found that quite quite a I was quite wrung out after that. So if you could have given yourself one piece of advice before um, writing the Cabal series, what would you have told yourself? Uh, well, apart from the obvious one being start earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Because I've, I've been going through some of my, um, in, in preparation for this chat, I've been going through some of my old uh, notebooks, and I've, I didn't realise um, Cabal as a novel had been in my mind quite so early. I knew that the character as Cabal, as this German guy, had been around in my head since about 1991-ish, I would guess. But I, I always thought it was a good five or six years before I started to think, oh, right, what if I expand this into a novel um and i'm checking my notes and there are actually chunks of novel in this notebook which <laughs> it's difficult to um exactly date it but from circumstantial evidence it must be earlier than 95 <laughs> so that that surprises me that i was thinking in terms of a novel that long ago so that's one thing the other thing um i wish i could clip myself around the lug hole and warn myself about is listen to george h Sithers when he gives you a bit of advice take some notice of it you idiot <laughs> george Sithers uh was um a very well-known editor mainly of um short form he worked on um weird tales and goodness knows what else and he was the guy who first published cabal he, uh, the uh the original story johannes cabal and the blustery day was the first short story and that was published in the first issue of a magazine called HP Lovecraft Magazine of Horror which is published by the same company who publishes um, Weird Tales and it was originally submitted to Weird Tales and they rejected it and I thought oh well and then months later I get this email saying we're launching this new magazine and we could do with um, some mordant comedy in it and uh, we're taking your story. We liked it, but it wasn't right for Weird Tales, so we put it to one side. Um, would you be interested in being in this new magazine? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm up for that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and the guy who who got in touch with me and did the editing and all the rest of it was 
George Scythers. And he, um, let, well, let's see. Johannes Cabal and the Bluster Day was published in issue one, and Exeunt Demon King was first published in issue three of the magazine. And George wrote to me and said, um, this is a really good series character you've got here. Have you considered writing a novel? And as it well, I actually had the novel sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> you should say that. Um, and he said, great, send me the first three chapters. I'll tell you what I think. So I sent him the first three chapters. And he got back to me and he said, uh, this is good. This is really publishable. You should, um, you, you should go with this. Just one thing. Um, the opening of chapter one kind of kills the story before it starts. <laughs> you should think about rewriting that. I'd just hack it out up to, say, lose the first three pages. And I was, I, well, I didn't say as much to him, but I was outraged at this. How dare he just flounce in the end. An editor telling me how to edit a story, the very thought. And uh, the thing was, I wanted this kind of Victorian Edwardian wandering around the horse, uh, horses, wandering around the houses business before the story proper starts. And so I, the first three or three or four pages, I think it was, consisted of, it was the plains of purgatory outside the other gates of hell. And it took as an example of what happens with purgatory, with the forms and everything, of this uh, cowboy who um, gets killed in the Old West and finds himself in purgatory. and discovers he's got to fill all these forms in. And so I went with that as the opening. And George said, it just gives the impression the cowboy's the protagonist. And then all of a sudden, Cabal walks past him, and the story swaps to him. And you never see the cowboy again. It confuses the reader. There are better ways of putting the information about hell over. Don't bother with all this business with the cowboy. And I went, oh, yeah, I guess, I suppose, oh, maybe. And then I didn't do it. <laughs> and... Um, and then about a year later, something like that, after Exeunt Demon King had been published, I have a friend who's a published author. And just in passing, I sent her this because we, we swapped work. And I, I sent her the manuscript for Exeunt Demon King and said, this has just been published. What do you think? And she wrote back and said, yeah, I can see why they're published. It's a good story. So we patted each other's egos for a while, you know, the usual stuff. And uh, that was that. And then months later, she wrote back to me and said, I can't stop thinking about that story of yours. Have you considered uh, writing a novel about that character? And I went, it just so happened. <laughs> and the same thing. I sent her a submission package, um, essentially, you know, synopsis in the first three chapters. And she read it and she said, this is good. It's very publishable. I can see this going. One thing. The opening of chapter one kills it stone dead. You've got all this business with this cowboy. Why are you bothering with him? And I went, um, oops. <laughs> so, yeah. So basically it was just underlining uh, what I should have done in the first place. Uh, happily, I had an unfinished short story, which was going to be called Johannes Cabal and the Devil's Silver. And I liked the beginning of it. And the rest of it just sort of turned into mush. It just couldn't hold its form properly. But it did have this opening that I really liked. And the opening was Cabal summoning a demon out in the woods. And so I was thinking, well, I need something to lead into where he's walking across purgatory. How does he get to purgatory in the first place? He makes a deal with the demon. And I happen to have this short story and cut and paste and then it went. And so that's that's how the opening to um, Necromancer came together. Never throw anything away. It could always come in useful. So, yes, um, my mess my message is to send through the trans temporal email to myself in 1995-ish or something would be in the f first place uh, start writing the novel now, in fact finish the novel now, <laughs> and B uh, when Joyce says it tells you to change the beginning, change the damn beginning. Use that use that Johannes Cabal and the Devil's Silver opening that never went anywhere. Use that. That's good. Go with that. So that's what I tell myself. Great. Amazing advice. <laughs> uh, hindsight. Hindsight. Um, so we recently heard that uh, Cabal was kind of optioned for a TV series. So we were wondering if we could hear a little bit more about that. Well, yes. It's um, it's an option for either TV or film. I'm, I'm not sure which what they're going with. Uh, it's the usual thing with um, 
uh, film and TV is they get the option and then you don't really hear anything about it again. <laughs> You're very much out of the loop. Yeah, you only created it. Shut your face. It's kind of like that. So um, I know very little more about it than anybody um, else outside the production company does. Um, but it is for potentially film or TV. I'm in two minds, which I'd prefer. I can see... I like the idea of a TV series because it gives it time to develop and um, just more space, more breathing space. You don't have to sort of accelerate the storytelling and cut out loads and loads of incidents to make it fit into a two-hour running time. On the other hand, I like films. I like them as nice, discrete chunks of storytelling. So I, I really am in two minds. I'm not sure which version I prefer. As for casting, um, people keep asking me casting, and I have no idea. <laughs> um, I can honestly say that when I write a book, I I do occasionally have real world people in particular roles. Um, for ex, even if for whatever reason, usually they're dead. They they won't be able to play it. Um, for example, um, uh, Kakon, the um, the irritating bloke in um, Johannes Cabal, the detective, was absolutely uh, Tony Hancock. Who's a who's um, a British comedian? That was absolutely Tony Hancock in my mind. In fact, his kind of persona is is kind of slightly snob, um, slightly snobbish, but very blue collar bloke who 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 had social climbing aspirations. Um, his persona had the middle name Aloysius, and I gave Cacon the, the middle name of Aloysius as well. He gave somebody else Mister. So yeah, so that happens. But for Cab- Johannes Cabal and Horst and uh, Leany Barrow and everybody else. No, they they exist from whole cloth in my imagination. I don't see a particular actor playing them. Um, so casting is is difficult. Well, the best I can do is that when people make suggestions, I can go, oh, I can see that. Or <laughs> <laughs> it's like um, I actually suggested. Pre Loki, somebody suggested Tom Hiddleston uh, for Cabal, and I thought, yeah, actually, I can see him. Um, he's possibly a little old now, unfortunately. In the in the books, Cabal is just reaching thirty, uh, whereas Tom Hiddleston's already thirty four. So uh, I don't know. I vaguely remember us having an argument mm-hmm. over Tom Hiddleston, and I think I said uh, Johannes, and you said Horse. <laughs> <laughs> He could actually play both quite easily. He's he's a good actor. I really like Hiddleston. Um and he's he seems a nice chap. Um so then again, I don't suppose that the films would be so behoven to um the chronology. So having a thirty four year old playing somebody who's twenty six, I yeah, they could get away with it. So yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind that. Also in my Twitter timeline recently, somebody suggested Enzo Cilenti. Who's, have you seen any of the uh, the BBC's Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell? No, I haven't. Oh, well, there's a character in there called Childermas, who's um, uh, Mr. Norrell's uh, servant, and who's who's a real sort of manipulative Machiavellian character, and he's he's played by this um, uh, British uh, British actor called Enzo Cilenti, and I think the man's brilliant. He's he does such a good job. I really like the character of Childermas. Um, in the book, and Chalenti does so much with him. Very, very good. But he's, he's the actor is 40 years old, so he, he's just too old to play Cabal, unfortunately. Um, on the other hand, I don't know, now I find myself thinking of, uh, oh, but he, he could play this character or that character or this other character instead, because I just like the guy. He's good. But beyond that, I don't really have um, much of a, a mental image for most of the, uh, the characters. Um, although occasionally personality-wise it comes through. Uh, have you read the the novella uh, A Long Spoon? Yes. Right, you're familiar with uh, Zarania, the devil? Yes. Uh, she's at least partially based on um, a British comedian called uh, Joyce Grenfell. She used to be in things like the uh, St. Trinian's films and all the rest of it, and she was all very jolly hockey sticks and upbeat and happy about everything. And so uh, I thought, 
that's the least likely possible personality for a devil. So that's what I did. This sort of very gleeful um, public school persona. <laughs> <laughs> I always kind of weirdly pictured Kabbalah as an anime. I always thought they could do so much with like kind of like. <gasps> well, actually, yes. I, I've thought in terms of animation as well. Maybe not necessarily an anime, although a lot of the um, the fan art there is in an anime style. So it's easy enough to imagine just by looking at those pictures. Mm-hmm. I keep thinking in terms of a sort of. Again, as I was saying earlier, Necromancy in particular, I, I wanted a sort of dreamlike feel of, an, of a green and pleasant land form of England that never really existed. And to kind of put that over, I, I do keep thinking in terms of live action actors and in stop frame animated environments. So that it's got this strong sense of artificiality, almost as if, if, almost as if they're acting in a, in a, a, in a doll theatre kind of thing. So it's kind of combination of animation and um, and live actors at the front. That will be an interesting way of doing it. And I can't think of anybody else who's done something quite so overtly in that. When I saw, oh lord, I always get the, the words in wrong. Is it Grand Budapest Hotel or Grand Hotel Budapest? It's Grand Budapest Hotel, Hotel, isn't it? When I saw that, I loved that because it has that strong air of artificiality in it. It's got a lot of model work in it, and they don't go to great pains to hide the fact that it is model work. It's gorgeous models, but you can see their models, and I liked that. It it made it feel distant and like like a fairy tale, like somebody telling you a story and how it kind of structures inside your head. So um, yeah, if if um, a version of Cabal done in that kind of style, I would be more than happy with. <laughs> Well, our last question. Um, what can you tell us about your um, upcoming novel, Carter and Lovecraft? Right. Um, Carter and Lovecraft's um, something new for me in several ways. In the first instance, purely on a, a, on a kind of business level, uh, it was something I was commissioned to write. So I I don't own it in the same way that I own, say, Cabal or the Rasalka Chronicles. Um, but I enjoyed it a lot. I've, uh, I'm contracted to write a second novel in the sequence so that's good uh, with any luck I'll, I'll be the contract will be ongoing uh, it comes out in October this year October the 20th I believe and it's yes it's very very different it's modern day it's um, reasonably urban it's uh, Lovecraftian horror and it's flat out horror it's yes it's got humorous bits in it because well it's me writing it I, I can't write something without putting some horror some humor into it but there's not a great deal of humor in it and there's some quite nasty bits it's more horror than humor um and it's yeah, it's it's enormously sweary as well. I've never had a free hand to have my character swearing quite so much as he do in this. It was very liberating. I enjoyed it. I see what I, I can see. I can see what Chuck Wendig gets out of this. It, it was quite good fun, um, and it's it's quite violent as well. And it's uh, oh, the other amusing thing is that it's entirely set in America. I I've never been to America. <laughs> But I've seen films. It's got cowboys and gangsters and stuff. I mean, how difficult can it be? <laughs> I had this lovely phone call. Uh, the the guy who was sorting out um, the IP and basically putting it together as a package, uh, because it it it's already been sold to Warner Brothers Television. Um, when I was first tapped to write it, we had this conference call between him, who I, I, I assume was on the West Coast at the time, my editor at Thomas Dunn Books, who published the uh, last two uh, of the, the Cabal novels, and we'll be publishing number five as well. Uh, he's he's in New York. And then there's me over here in the, in the English West Country, just outside uh, Bristol. Oh, which is sort of, you know, Long John Silver Uwa country. And um, we're chatting away, and uh, the guy handling the, uh, the the packaging deal says, um, your, your accent, um, you, 
would I be right in saying that you're English? I said, uh, yeah, 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 I'm English. You're not American. No, no, I'm English. I'm like, okay. Uh, but you're living in America. No, 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 I'm not living in America. Um, I'm living in, in the West Country. Went, oh, right. But you've been to America. <laughs> And there was this long pause, and uh, my editor jumped in and said, <laughs> he can do it, don't worry, he can do it. Um, and yes, I mean, good Lord knows, I've, I've read um, enough American books, and I, it, it's it's hardly an unknown world to me. And there are certainly American writers who, who cheerfully write stuff set in England, and that works very well, so it's a two-way street. And I also had the facility of several layers of editors reading my stuff and going, no, <laughs> an American would never say that, try this instead. So, which filters out a, that kind of stuff. Um, some of which is is always a bit surprising. Um, things like, uh, I mean, I managed to cotton on to very quickly during the writing not to say, to say gotten rather than got a lot of the time, which is more subtle than, say, pavement versus sidewalk or things like that. Uh, but there are other things yet more subtle than got versus gotten. So, um, though, but where where I didn't catch them, my editors, editors did, bless their hearts. And I did a scad load of research, and uh, Google Street View is absolutely my friend. <laughs> <laughs> kind of puts me in mind of Neil Gaiman. Um talking about his American Gods series, and he's like, yeah, I had originally wrote a series that was supposed to be what America is like, and then I actually got here, and out came American Gods, and it was completely different. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yes, I'm very, very dependent on my editors, admittedly. Uh, I mean, for, fortunately, it is it is the great font of media, so... And I watch an awful lot of American stuff, so um, uh, the mindset is there, and what needed tweaking, I think, was relatively light. But with any luck, if um, the the Cabal TV film thing takes off, or the uh, the Carlton Lovecraft film uh, TV series rather takes off, then perchance I will finally get to visit America. That'll be nice. <laughs> I'll buy a Stetson, especially. Just so I don't stand out. <laughs> well, you'll know exactly what to call the sidewalk now. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, I'll in. call it pavements pointedly. It's a bit on principle. Uh, actually, I think that would make an amazing short story. <laughs> it's just the disconnect between words. Oh, great. I, I did actually write a short story a long time ago. It's never been published. And it was about this um, idea of um, a weapon that could rewrite people's memories so that they thought they were something they weren't. And it was developed by this bonkers uh, American general. And he intended to launch it at the Soviet Union, as it was then. That's how old the story is. Oh, remember to breathe. That's how old the story is. Um, and the missile falls short and lands on Britain. And um, Britain, and it turns out the weapon doesn't work brilliantly. And it turns Britain into this bizarre kind of thinks it's America, but so isn't. <laughs> um, and the short story is from the uh, the point of view of that. So yeah, yeah, I kind of have already done that story sort of. <laughs> Okay. Any more we have a we have a funny story actually. Okay, far away. Um, <laughs> we were at a, a writing conference and there was a dance in the evening, mm -hmm. and we were sitting in this room and in walked someone in full cosplay, and they were dressed up as Johannes the Ball. <laughs> Excellent. Perfectly like tall, blonde, skinny. Like perfectly dressed, right down to the skull cane. <laughs> and so we're watching this, and there aren't many people in this room, but lo and behold, this guy dressed as Cabal starts to dance, and he is like Broadway trained <laughs> as he's dancing around the room. <laughs> and just, like, he was doing the Charleston, he was, like, dancing with two girls at once. He was just 
the most suave, like, toe-pointed dancer I have ever seen in my life. And watching this, just the disconnect blew my mind. <laughs> I, now, now you give me an idea for a story about a body swap between Johannes and Horst. <laughs> <laughs> so we saw that and we thought we should share it <laughs> no that's excellent it's it's hugely flattering all the uh, we were talking about at least touching upon fan art earlier and that and the cosplay and and things like that it is it's it's flattering but it's also very humbling it really draws home to you the fact that once your book's out there, once it's published and it's on, out on shelves and on people's e-readers, that it's no longer really yours. It's what they make of it. So, um, which I think is a salutary lesson to uh, to any, not just any writer, but any creator as well. Um, well, I, I think it's definitely building up steam. I think it's just going to explode one day. <laughs> well, yes, there's a, there's a heartening number of. Um, uh, the number of kind of little references and things to it that I, I pick up uh, seem to be increasing steadily. So you know, fingers crossed, something might something might pop. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to to talk to us. This has been absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Very kind. Thank you for having me. Thanks so Thanks much. So much. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much. I'll see you around. Bye-bye.